Thank you very much for coming to our talk. This is Scaling Data and AI to Increase Player Engagement and Satisfaction at Square Enix. Uh, I'm Sam Weeks from Google Cloud, and with me today we have, from your left, John House, Senior Data Engineering Manager, Square Enix, Tatsuo Yoshida, Director of Data Science, Square Enix, and Debley, AI ML Specialist, Google Cloud. So we're all from uh, London, all flew in over the weekend. Thanks very much for, for having us. OK, this is what we're going to go through today. Uh, first of all, John is going to talk about Single Game Review, which is the uh, global data platform that Square Enix have built. Then Tatsuo will talk about uh, some of the new data science use cases that he's built uh, on top of Single Game Review, especially those that um, focus on player engagement and uh, player satisfaction. And then lastly, Deb will talk to us about where we want to take this in the future in terms of operationalizing some of these use cases on Google Cloud. The journey with Square Enix and Google Cloud has been a successful one and a fairly long one. Uh, it started back in 2017, actually with Single Game Review, which John will talk about in a minute. Uh, we moved it over to Google Cloud to deal with uh, scalability issues that they had on-prem. And since then, there have been uh, many milestones and improvements and additional um, uh, workloads as well coming to Google Cloud, including the platform services that power their games and the first party identity system to uh, manage their players and the player's lifecycle. Uh, we call out a previous talk actually at GDC uh, in 2019, which was also on single game review, uh, but spoke more about the foundations of single game view and the, and the initial use cases. And today we're going to um, uh, sort of talk a bit more about what we've been doing in more recent times. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be sharing the stage with Square Enix. Um, John and Tatsu are both uh, leaders in their fields, respective fields, uh, and they're really pushing the boundary on what's possible with data when utilized in the right way. So the last thing I want to say before passing on is we actually think that now is a really interesting time to be talking about data, um, especially first party data. I think historically we would leverage cookies and third party data and use marketing agencies a lot to do that. And that ended up meaning that we sort of outsourced a lot of the uh, player relationship that, that we would have to these marketing agencies. Um, now cookies are kind of going away. That forces us to maybe think a little bit differently and sort of take back um, ownership of the player relationship, um, which is probably a good thing, but it does mean that there's a growing need for in-house data capabilities and data platforms that can scale globally uh, and provide us real-time insights and real-time decision-making. And we at Google think Google Cloud is the data analytics platform for live service games. Um, if you go to any of the other Google Cloud talks um, this week, You'll hear more about that, and I'd encourage you to do so. But for now, it's just great that we can stand with a brand as well-known and well-loved as Square Enix, and they can talk directly about um, their own um, experiences. So with that, I will pass over to John, and he'll talk us through Single Game Review. Thank you, John. Thanks very much, Sam. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm John, head of data engineering here at Square Enix. I've been in technology across news and games for 16 years, 11 of which have been at Square, where over the last five years, I have headed up the data engineering team. Um, I'm interested in games, reliable processing of data, and obligatory cat picture, my cat Cleo. It was either a picture of Cleo or me. I think I made the right choice. <laughs> so as uh, Sam mentioned, we've been working with Google Cloud on SGE for a number of years. Um, I'm going to do a bit of a recap on that um, and then basically move on to how we've extended that in more recent times before handing over to Tatsuo. So why Google Cloud? We felt there was a very strong networking infrastructure underpinning the cloud services, which met our data processing needs, allowing us to really collect data at a vast scale. We really appreciated the engineering-led culture of Google Cloud, 
and the team had a really embedded feel within the teams on our side. And the overall platform had a very nice uniform feel, giving you all the options you needed to deploy your services, but not overloading you with stuff you really didn't need to worry about. And of course, off the shelf, it has BigQuery, which met the SQL needs of the analytics team out of the box. Our requirements for moving off our old on-prem system were that we wanted to be able to capture data at any scale, process it in near real time, store it at a, well, vast level in our centralized data store, build data warehousing um, layers on top of that, and make it available to consume within the business in BI and advanced analytics processes. We, of course, have a requirement to our fans to handle their data securely and safely. So we wanted to be able to perform filtering of that data within our data processing pipelines, ensuring we didn't recapture anything we didn't want to. And um, in our view layers, not expose that data unnecessarily and then be able to process that and remove that from our data stores um, as needed. The MVP architecture we came up with generally follows the Google reference architecture for data streaming and data processing. So from our games, we would be able to collect that into Cloud PubSub and GCS where we couldn't implement streaming at the time. We then process that with data flow, batch and streaming as necessary before storing that within um, BigQuery and then consuming that in Looker and Power BI. In data flow, we offer a number of features which really complement our game development studios. We can um, do things like validate and store rejected events if any come in and allow them to take a look at them and fix any issues. We can back up events as required. We can do the aforementioned PI filtering and we can dynamically migrate the schemas in BigQuery if anything changes in real time. Now, this is really valuable to the um, studios and we found that unfortunately, there were a few bottlenecks within our initial pipelines. We worked very closely with the Google Cloud support team to come up with techniques to remedy that. So we moved from insert IDs, offloading the deduplication that they would have otherwise offered to separate processes downstream. We moved our rate limit to a volume limit, and we made, we made um, a few tweaks to some of the parameters afforded to us in Dataflow, things like batch parallelism, streaming keys, that kind of thing, which allowed us to ensure that we could meet our self-imposed million events a second per pipeline, albeit with a bit of a trade-off at lower scaling. Now, as I mentioned, there were a few architectural changes. The core uh, critical path of the data remains broadly the same, but we split out our streaming pipeline into two halves, allowing us to scale them independently and use different workers more suited to the tasks that they performed. Otherwise, the architecture remained broadly the same, but we were able to have a consistent sub two second-ish end-to-end time from when data hit our pub sub in endpoints to it being inserted and into BigQuery and being made available to the business. Implementing these features also allowed us to add new data sources to our data lake. These include web events, user account information, social data, CRM, sales, 
and a few others, which allowed us to activate the data differently with our partners in um, advertising and, more importantly, the data science team. Our current environment consists of using Google Colab notebooks for um, code sharing for Python and SQL scripts before um, when productionizing them via our GitLab CI CD environment, um, offloading the orchestration onto Google Cloud Composer and having the main bulk of the workloads running in GKE. Now, we are also looking at potentially moving those workloads into Vertex AI platform. But to talk you through that and um, the data science use cases, I will hand you over to Tatsuo Yoshida, our Director of Data Science. Yeah. Thank you, Zoran. And OK, I need to go next. OK, so I'm Tatsuo. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Director of Data Science in Analytics and Insight Department. I've been working with Phoenix for um, six years and previously worked in advertising agency. Um, we have a data science team. We built a team in 2020, so it's a relatively new team. And in 2022, uh, we made machine learning pipeline, which gave us the power to deploy machine learning model into production. And as you can see, we are a pet friendly team. It's Arnie. By the way, it's not my dog. <laughs> 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 so, Today, I want to talk to you about how we use data science for CRM, customer relationship management. <clears throat> so these are the business challenges we are facing. Like when we send email, we want to make sure that the email we send is relevant. The second point is that we don't necessarily want to measure email only by opens or clicks, because what we really want is to increase engagement. The third point is that um, when you do A-B testing, it many times gets complicated, especially in a company like Square Enix, because we have offices in Japan, US, and UK. Totally different time zone, really. So that's why we have this machine learning-based email solution. Machine learning model sends an email, then we measure in-game data. And this in-game engagement data is going to be fed back to machine learning model. And this feedback loop makes sure that the email we send is relevant. The first use case is tailored messaging for Final Fantasy XIV. Final Fantasy XIV, as you may know, is an online title. It's been running for 10 years. We have in total 27 million players. <clears throat> so Final Fantasy XIV can be played in so many different ways. Um, it's a role-playing game, so you progress story or you fight against enemies. But that's not everything the game can offer. Um, you can, the game offers non-battle content like crafting or gathering, or it has some social aspect like housing or free company. So the game can be played in so many different ways. So it's really important for us to understand how player play this game. That's why we are currently using machine learning model to segment user into five different groups. Low engagement, PBE player, craft and gatherer, PBP player, and high engagement. So we have this um, model, and then the question is, how do we use this? We have the engagement campaign called free login campaign. What this is, is that we are welcoming user who stop playing the game to come back to the game. And in the email, we are announcing this free login campaign to user. We pick content which suits each user's play style. And this results in more people participating in free login campaign. And the most importantly is that we see more people actually engaging in in-game content. That's really good. Then the second use case is automated A-B testing cycle for Life is Strange True Cars. It's a single player adventure game. 
So,、um, we are currently sending email automatically to those who stop playing the game, and we are encouraging them to come back to the game and continue playing the game. And before I talk about automation, I want to talk about what is A-B testing.、Um, it's really simple. Well, you test a few things、um, to see which works best. That's it, really. <laughs> But in reality, it can be really, really complex. Well, it's a horrible presentation, I know.、Um, the first thing you need to do is that you create user group. OK, this is a group, let's use pattern A, this is a group, pattern B, C, D. And if you make any mistake, then it could result in really bad, like sending the same email twice to the same user, or we end up sending email without any subject line. It's horrible. Yeah. Then after we send the email,、um, well, we want to know how it went. So we join in game data and email data, and、uh, we,、uh, we end up writing hundreds of SQL code. And it's really difficult to debug because it's full of joins. <clears throat> and then we compare performance. And if you only have pattern A and pattern B, it's kind of simple. But if you have so many patterns, and we sometimes end up doing multivariate testing. It's an advanced topic for data science, and really. And well, then we do report to stakeholders in so many different time zones. And the biggest issue here is that step two to step four needs to be completed in really such short time. It's really tough. But now we have this automated cycle, and I've explained a lot in the previous page, and everything is automated now. And this is actually a use case. So, going back to Life is Strange True Cards case, we prepare three subject line and we provide those to machine learning models. Of course, machine learning model does not know at the beginning which works best, so it just chooses subject line randomly from those three choices. And then, after that, machine learning model starts realizing okay, pattern B seems to be working, so it increases the pattern B more and more. So, it's really amazing that it's, as I said, it's automated, and that if you do this in a manual way, it's kind of horrible, I guess. <coughs> yeah, and also, this machine learning automation is making everyone happy. This made our life much easier, really, because, as I said, we had manual process, and it was really difficult to maintain, especially during holiday seasons, well, simply because everyone is on holiday. And also, you know, manual reporting. With、um, different stakeholders in different time zones. If you do this once and twice, then that's fine. But if you do this in a regular way, then it's kind of complex and difficult. And also, this is making our fans happy. So now, customers receive less email, and the email they receive is relevant to what they want. And we see people、um, coming back to the game, continue playing the game. And finish the game and go to the next game. So we are making fans happy. So, the summary of Sync Gamer View, which is Quenix's in house solution, is that we have all the data in one place, and with this, we can provide repos to, across to the entire organization. And、uh, we provide data to Game Studio so the studio can make better game. And as I've explained, And we are improving fans' engagement. And also, thanks to the data engineer team, and we get data in, the, in a real time, in a reliable fashion, and also it's GDPR compliant. Yeah. And next step for data science is that so far, so good, I guess. And however, the current situation is that the more model we create, The more model we need to monitor and maintain, and it's getting really complex. So that's why we are currently exploring Vertex AI, which is GCP managed machine learning solution. This should make our life much easier. And for details, I'll hand over to Deb. Nice. 
nice. Thank you very much, Tatsuo. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Lee. Uh, I get to work with this amazing team. So I'm from Google Cloud, and I work very closely in the data analytics and AI machine learning space. Uh, so I'm going to step back a little bit and actually you know, put a bit of perspective around just companies that are trying to scale their AI workloads. Uh, and just to really call it the fact that you know, seeing success with deploying these types of models and being able to do that in a real-time fashion should not be understated in terms of the difficulty that surrounds these types of processes in that um, even now, only like 36% of data science POCs actually even tend to make it into production. Uh, and that could be for a variety of reasons. So maybe it, the business teams have difficulty actually identifying which use cases are gonna be the highest value for them. Uh, maybe you just don't have enough machine learning or you know, data engineering, DevOps skill sets to do as much as what you actually want to do. Uh, and then oftentimes the data itself, so you might have the best idea, the skills to support it, but you don't actually have all those data sources in a consumable format, you know, standardized together. You don't have a single game review, for example, to actually start using it. Then it's really difficult to deploy these kinds of models. Um, and then, you know, when you get to that point and you're you're seeing, you know, really good business success, you've you've seen the ROI on your investment. You can be a victim of your own success, wherein you're like, great, now everyone wants a data science model. How do we move faster? And that's where things like the infrastructure that you're using, managed services for things like model monitoring, endpoints, you know, training and serving pipelines start to give you that ability to scale, you know, 10x faster rather than, okay, we're going to have to hire 10 more data scientists in order to be able to scale, you know, for what we need to do. The, um, so this sort of where we think Google Cloud adds a lot of value in this area and what we're really excited about as a team uh, to start integrating into uh, the stack that John actually just took you through is Vertex AI, which is our managed um, machine learning lifecycle platform. So you can do everything from building your models, right? So whether you want to do custom coding yourself, use like an auto ML, we'll talk about auto ML in a minute, um, all the way through to, you know, what you actually need to keep the lights on for that model in production. The, um, you don't really have to use all these services. You can pick and choose which ones you want. But for this team, what we're really focusing in on is how can we move faster by using the managed versions of everything that we want to do? So how do we create templates of the pipelines for similar types of use cases so that we can recycle that code and we're not recreating the wheel every single time we want to put a model into production? How do we use things like automated model monitoring to just have it run the training serving SKU detection for us rather than us writing those tests again and again every single time. This is where I think data science teams are going to be able to move even faster. So one of the first use cases that I want to talk about uh, is the sort of, I'd say the next evolution of the reinforcement use, learning use case that you just heard Tatsuo talk about in terms of that online learning system whereby it's not just a static model, it's actually learning from how people interact with the emails that they're opening. So if you think about these types of systems, there are a few challenges with them that actually aren't just about building the model itself, which are actually really about how do you maintain that entire system for the model, right? Because people are gonna change how they interact. You're not just gonna send the same email, right, to people over and over again. You're gonna, you might change the time of the day that you send the email. You might change the messaging that you send in that email. So you wanna have an agent that's able to learn on the fly, but then also simultaneously give you the ability to retrain when you need to, when the world has changed. Because we want to keep the content as relevant as possible. Nobody wants to get spam emails, right? That are totally useless to them. So, you know, we're going to be um, implementing an approach using the AutoML functionality within Vertex. And we, this is going to be very powerful in the sense that this gives us the ability to take advantage of that neural architecture search that's happening. You see all those crazy squiggles over there. That's, that's searching through a lot of different types of model architectures to determine you know, what is the best model for this use case given what I might already know, like the context, the training data that I have. This gives us the ability to start to tap into things like neural network architectures, boosted tree architectures, without having to write tons of code for that every single time. Then because we'll build it in Vertex, we can then integrate it into a Vertex pipeline seamlessly so that it's not just gonna be, we have to build this model from scratch in the whole system for every single deployment, like every game or every type of agent. We can now start to recycle the template that we've built so that we can 
you know, roll this out much more broadly, much more quickly. So, you know, you're taking your deployment time from, you know, maybe two to three months down to like days or maybe a week or something like that. So it's quite powerful in that sense. Um, and then the sort of, I think, other use case that um, we're really excited about is really to leverage the functionality within Vertex around the endpoints for online serving. So from online serving perspective, this really refers to um, basically making the you know, prediction capabilities from a model constantly available. So you want this to just be available as a service that you can ping and get an output from um, sort of any time, as well as if there's certain periods where you have a lot of traffic or a lot of things happening, the ability for that those prediction requests to be able to scale up or down as needed so things don't just fall over, right? So, you know, a common challenge, uh, I would say, you know, thinking about the industry is the sort of the separation in terms of the back end frameworks between, you know, how games may be built versus how data science teams tend to work historically. So you might have, you know, um, a back end in C sharp or something like that too. But then you have, you know, all these models from a data science perspective that have been built in like Python or maybe you're using. Um, you know, R or something like that, or bits of SQL here and there. So how do we close the gap between not necessarily putting more engineering effort on the separate teams to try to do something that they wouldn't normally do, but then also get them to work more closely together and take advantage of basically, you know, the skills and the services that both provide. So you, on Vertex, you can take a model, package it up, um, create your serving container, and then put it onto an endpoint so that it can just basically pack, be packaged up as, you know, an HTTP service, really. So you're just sort of pinging it and you're getting a JSON response back. This is where we think we're going to really start to close the gap in terms of being able to test more models more quickly. So this allows us to really quickly prototype different use cases, experiment more quickly, see what works, as well as sort of, you know, be able to keep the responsibilities of the game team with the game and then also the sort of ownership of that model, knowing when to retrain the model, when to test a new version of the model, can stay with the data science team. So they don't also necessarily have to change their way of working from an MLOps perspective of how they would put that model into production, for example. So this, I think, is a really exciting way that we can start to bring real-time like AI model prediction service requests into the games without having to really change very much in terms of like architecture, skill sets, what people are actually working on. Uh, so once again, let us accelerate and do more. Uh, yeah, so I think we're just up at time now. Uh, thank you very much for coming to the talk. We will be around, I think we have a minute or two maybe for questions. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we can talk about some questions, but thanks very much. Come to find us, talk to us. Thank you.